Dr. King's vision of a more equitable and just society made him a target. He was radical in his thinking and ministry and was considered an agitator by his enemies and even some in his own community. His approach to nonviolent organized political and social action was often met with opposition by both white government officials, black leaders, and racist enemies. On January 17th, the nation honors and celebrates the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Since the inception of the federal holiday, the legacy of Dr. King's work has often been watered down and in many ways hijacked to justify the very opposite of what Dr. King fought and died for. I'm Danielle Sanders, Managing Editor of the Chicago Defender and National News Manager for Real Times Media. This year, the Chicago Defender wants to know what Dr. King's vision looks like today. We reached out to community leaders, activists, and advocates and experts in law, politics, healthcare, and education to ask the question, what does social justice look like now? In his own words, the Reverend Michael L. Flager, senior pastor of the faith community of St. Sabina says, St. Sabina is, I believe, more than a congregation, but a teaching ground where countless people from around the world pass through our doors and take something with them. It is a ground where denominational walls have been dismantled and racial barriers removed. It is a ground where the spirit of the Lord has brought freedom and where young and old, wealthy and poor have been welcomed. In 1981, at the age of 31, he became the youngest full pastor in the diocese when he was appointed pastor of St. Sabina Church. For over 40 years, Father Flager has ministered and been an advocate for the poor, disenfranchised, and discriminated against. Inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Father Flager has modeled his ministry after Dr. King, believing church truly exists outside of Sunday service and the walls of a building. He has consistently fought against racism, inequality, gun violence and injustice. Week after week, he inspires the members of St. Sabina Church and the entire Auburn Gresham community to continue the legacy of Dr. King through service, action, and activism. Father Flager was a friend to the King family and was the keynote speaker for the family's commemorative service in 2003 and 2017. He was also one of the speakers asked to eulogize Coretta Scott King in 2006. Today, Father Michael Flager speaks with the Chicago Defender about Dr. King's legacy and what it means in 2022. Um, what do you think social justice means today? I think social justice, um, first of all, let me just put it in the framework of the faith communities. Um, I think we have... Um, neglected our call for it and our, our prophetic voice for it. Um, and social justice has been pushed to the side and it needs to be the DNA of all faith communities, Christian, Muslim, and Jew. Um, but I think what it means today is being the voice of and being the, um, uh, the, the push, if you will, for equality and equity on every level um, so that everybody has an equal opportunity and access to their purpose, to their dream, to education, to housing, to food, um, to a decent job, to take care of themselves. So I think social justice means the, the willingness or the commitment to say that one will use their voice and use their platform or their profile, whatever that may be, um, to, to form a society where everybody has equal opportunity and access and equity to move forward and, and a respect mm. on every level um, uh, for folks that we can disagree, but we will always be respectful and honor and reverence each other as human beings and as 
brothers and sisters. So I think from the standpoint of, of, of as well as, I mean, I can't ignore it, um, but meeting the needs of those who are disenfranchised, uh, forgotten, alienated, demonized right now, being there to meet their needs, whether it's housing, whether it's food, whether it's education, whatever, but then transforming the society that has created these needs. And I think in this day and time, it's going to be really dismantling um, some structures of society that continue to keep people poor, uneducated, um, um, without access or opportunity to, to their things that they should be granted by this constitution. So it's meeting the immediate needs and transforming the society that has created those needs. And, you know, we, we talk about, you know, especially with the church, how influential the church was when it came to issues around social justice. It was the gathering point. It was the safe space that people were able to come organize, get information and, and, and even get involved in politics and things of that nature. It was a centralized location uh, rooted in our communities. And you talked about how we've lost that a little bit. What have been the challenges um, faced by the social justice movement in general? And how has that changed over the past few years? Well, I think a couple of things. I think number one, that um, the faith communities have become so corporate and become another business in society. And so, um, and become in many ways, the instruments of Pharaoh, um, whether that be in the Congress, whether it be in the president, whether it be a governor, be a mayor, that I think we have to work with those elected leaders. We have to pull up the chair at the table, even when we're not invited. And but we have to come there with the viewpoint ours is coming from the from the foundation of faith. And ours is coming to understand that we must be the voice for the disenfranchised, the disinherited, and the forgotten and alienated. Um, every everybody has a lobbyist in DC but the poor. Mm -hmm. They have no lobbyists because the their lobbyists should be the faith communities, Christian, Muslims, and Jews. That should be their lobbyists. But I think faith communities have become so and re, the religion has taken over and we become our own golden calves and um, honoring ourselves um, uh, embedded in ourselves uh, about building ourselves and for God, our mission is supposed to be for the poor, the forgotten. We should be their voice and we should be the moral compass to a society that seems to have lost its soul. And so I think, um, you look back at, at the movements, as you mentioned, in, in history. I mean, Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X um, were rooted in Islam. Their faith was their core. Dr. King, faith was his core. It was foundation. Wherever possible, every meeting he had was within the context of church. It began with prayer. It had scripture. Um, it had singing. And then there were marching orders. And Dr. King, from, from the Christian tradition, I think, is one of the best in modern history that was to be able to understand that our very Christian faith demands that we be about the freedom and the liberation of all people. And so faith was the, the foundation of everything that he did. And yet, um, since then, we've seen that, you know, we have all these churches that have Dr. King pictures hanging up, but it really was almost a mockery to the Dr. King, who was the voice for liberation and freedom. We, we become so, uh, so done like we've done with so many leaders and we've, um, you know, redefined them and watered them down to make them acceptable um, to, to the major society. Dr. King was radical. Dr. King, you know, throughout his, his, his um, career of, of preaching, you know, confronted society. You know, he, he confronted the war in Vietnam a year before he died. He confronted preachers. He confronted the white Christian community. You know, and, and we, we've we so watered him down. So not just so 
society can feel comfortable, but unfortunately the church can feel comfortable not living in the, the model that he gave us. So I think churches have been compromised. And I think that um, uh, we've forgotten our identity, like maybe like so many people um, in society, our, we've had, we're, we're a result of a stolen identity and we've got to get our identity back. Remember who we are. And how, how does the faith community do that in a time where the there's a certain level of apathy um, and uh, a, a perpetual side eye given to faith communities now based on you know what they see um, as far as the lack of inaction or some of the you know inconsistencies. How does the faith community get back to a place where their go to? where there, um, there's a level of reverence and the respect for those leaders and what they're talking about, things that we need to do. How do you, particularly with young people, how do you get them involved in, in social justice movements that are rooted in faith communities? Well, I think a couple of things. I think, first of all, yes, some of it has become apathy. Mm -hmm. Some of it has become fear because they don't want to ruffle the waters. They, want, they don't want to stop being invited um, to the prayer breakfasts and the, and the meetings um, and, and taking the pictures. Um, and I think so some have, been, some have been apathetic and some have been compromised. Um, but I think how we get back to it is, from the Christian standpoint, go to the Bible. You know, Jesus was a radical revolutionary. He came against government and he came against religion. It was government and religion that killed him because he was confronting them. Remember, the, the harshest words he ever spoke was to the church. Yeah. Called them vipers and hypocrites. Um, he stood up against the Roman government. He stood up against um, what had become the hypocrisy in religion, went in the temple and turned over tables. And so what have you turned the temple into? And so I think the way the Christian church gets back to its, its real identity is go back to the scriptures, go back to our identity. Not how we've redefined them, not how what's become popular in prosperity preaching or mega church or, um, and all the stuff that has been identified as, as Christianity. That's not Christianity. Go back to our roots in the scriptures. Go back to understanding who we represent. We represent as Christians, Jesus Christ, who was a radical revolutionary who gave his life um, to transform a government and transform religion and who um, was unashamedly about it. And, and that he, 98% um, of all his work was outside the temple mm -hmm. and yet we're constantly telling everybody come in and and recognizing we've lost our, we've lost our our identity because i think we've disconnected from christ and disconnected from the real jesus and we are guilty i mean you look today i mean and it's been done it's not new i mean you know people use christianity to justify slavery you know, to justify Jim Crow, to justify supremacy. So we've watched it um, pimped, if you will, for ages for people's per their own agenda. But if you take the scriptures in the context of the person, Jesus, and the context of his preaching and teaching, re you realize he didn't justify any of those things. He, in fact, fought all those things. So it's getting back to the true Jesus and to the true scriptures and not on what it has become today, which is um, in my, in my mind, real mockery to what real Christianity and, and, and real, the real Christ is all about. He was a radical revolutionary. I've heard you speak before, especially when you talk about Dr. King and talk about how, while he was a threat, people didn't really come after him until he shifted focus from not just civil rights to economic rights. And we're in yep. a time now, particularly since the insurrection of last year, 
where you see the attack on education and critical race theory. You see active voter suppression uh, happening all across the country. You see this really very clear divide um, as far as going backwards in, in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Do you, feel like the, the, do you feel like much has changed since Dr. King really started, you know, pushing the poor people's campaign and really pushing for economic empowerment amongst all people? Do you see a difference? Are we still battling the same demons as a country? Absolutely. I think what we've been conditioned to feeling that as long as we have some that have made it, things are better, while the masses are suffering and struggling. So that's why we continue to hear about the, you know, the Oprah's or continue to hear about the uh, Denzel Washington's or the Will Smith's. Uh, we hear and we see so much of those who have made it through all of this um, that we've that there's trying to conditioning that the media tries to do to make us think, well, things are better. Look at, look at this one and this one, look at Tiger Woods, look it up, look at all Michael Jordan's. But the reality is that's a, that's a very slim number while masses are struggling and masses are suffering from communities that have been neglected and abandoned and terrorized um, by poverty and by, um, by evil. Um, so, I think that what's happened today is you know, we've we've also been very comfortable with kind of like the flavor of the day or some superficial actions um, for, you know, I've been so disappointed. You know, I, I thought, well, maybe when a George Floyd becomes a world issue of what happened to him, that maybe this would be a turning point that we'd really be substantive about. What do we have to do to really change the conditions of America? Um, we should have been, we should have learned that it, nothing substantive was done when it keeps happening. <laughs> when we keep seeing every week another black person shot or killed um, or murdered or hung or dis you know, found dead in a, in, a, in a jail cell. We should be seeing, no, nothing really changed. We had all this this superficial um, taking down statues while the, while the philosophy of that person still exists, you know, um, taking down Confederate flags while the Confederate spirit still exists. Um, and yet, and, 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 and hashtags of Black Lives Matter happening all over and not just in the streets, but in, in corporate America, you know, they were speaking about it. They were talking about it. Um, but then you look a year later and say, boards haven't changed. <laughs> um, corporate identity hasn't changed. Um, the F, you know, when you talk about Dr. King, the economic, the economics of the African-American community have not changed. So, so unless there's a, a real foundational change, you know, these things make us, make us feel better as if all oh, things must be better. Look at all the Black Lives Matter flags. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Or the hiring of some people into positions in corporate America that had no power, yeah. but had their a black face in the room now. But first of all, oftentimes carefully pick the black face they're gonna have in the room, That's who's right. not gonna trouble the waters who is going to be a part of the team yeah. and not say this team ain't right. Not challenge it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so we look back now and, and realize the need, the white supremacist need was on George Floyd's neck that killed him. It's still a knee that lives on America's neck in the black community and brown community that is still killing them. And nobody's talking about that knee. And we, there's almost a sense of way we, we talked about this. We put out a statement, you know, we put out a hashtag. We, we, you know, or even the sense, and, and I'm all in agreement that we, that Juneteenth should have been become a holiday. I'm all in agreement with that. But again, th those become superficial things. Yeah. 
um, until we do, until those days, whether it's Dr. King's holiday, whether it's Juneteenth, no matter, until we have the courage to do substantive formational changes, these are feel-good events that the day after, everything's still the same. I said this, we had a march down on, on Michigan Avenue on December 31st about those who are killed who were killed in the last year, especially the young people. And it just was amazing to me that that night, there was supposedly the largest um, fireworks show Chicago ever had. And there was going to be all this, this going on to make us feel good about a year that we should be in mourning about, we should be outraged about. And there was no mention that day by the city of the horrible death rate and murder rate and homicide rate. There was no mention that day about the tale of two cities. There was no mention that day about the realities of a Chicago that is divided and racist. And, and we just, let's have fireworks and everybody feel good. Um, and that's happening across America. So until we have the courage um, from the bottom up and from the top down to do substantive changes in this country, economic changes. Because you can see after all that, that happened, like the, Dr. King said, and, I, and I'll never forget this. He said that it didn't cost any money to desegregate lunch counters. In fact, they made money. <laughs> it didn't cost any money to desegregate bus, uh, bus stops. Didn't cost any money for the civil rights law or the voting rights law for people to vote. And none of that cost any money. He said, yet, if we change the economics to justice in this country, it's going to cost trillions of dollars. And America has neither the will, the courage, or the desire to spend money on that. While we have take care of infrastructure, and while we'll spend money on all kinds of things that are going on in cities right now, and we've increased police forces and law enforcement and all this, we're still not willing to put the trillions of dollars it's going to demand for a country that's fair. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing how those words still ring true. I was yeah. talking to the... Uh, and remember, Danielle, that's, that's when they decided he had to die. Yeah. When he decided to talk about, okay, now we're going after the economics of this country. Bam. Mm -hmm. He's got to die now. Yeah, that's when he became a real threat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm seeing that even as we look at the COVID-19 pan pandemic, I'm seeing that as we start to address or have people, you know, who really start to call a thing a thing and call this stuff out, they're labeled you know, as extremists or, you know, these rebel rousers and they're giving these kind of, you know, um, negative titles, um, which is what people seem to forget about Martin Luther King. He was not celebrated when he was live at all, especially no. so here, um, particularly, you know, right wing people quote Dr. King. It's just like, it just seems <laughs> like we've whitewashed that legacy and the legacy really was him attacking the status quo and being killed as a result. So I just, as we, you know, come around this time where we're looking at his birthday, looking at his legacy, what, what would you like to see done from a political level, from a, a, a federal level, all the way down to local? We're still fighting to have a Voting Rights Act, <laughs> you know, like in 2022. Yeah, yeah. I just find that to be such a contradiction. Like, what would you like to see from, from our nation's leaders? Well, I guess I'd like to see, rather than just having breakfasts and lunches and dinners in his honor, mm -hmm. which I really oftentimes make me angry because what happens at those is either one or two things, either we we don't address the real Dr. King at them and we help continue the, the lie about who he was, or we do have speeches that identify the real challenges he presented America 
and then feel like, all right, we've done our part now. Yeah. And we've talked about it. I would like to see bold, courageous, um, radical decisions that would say on Dr. King's birthday as a country, as a state, as a city, we are going to uh, make sure and fight any kind of um, voter suppression that is going on in America, and we will stop it. We will come against it, um, and we will we will fight it at every level. I would like to see that we are going to take the same approach um, that we did with COVID, and that is, you know, the the communication, the marketing, the the millions and millions of dollars we spent on that to to fight racism, to fight violence. Um, that we're going to, uh, you know, let's, let's say in a city uh, like Chicago, that on this Dr. King's Day, we're going to announce that we are going to open up four mental health clinics in the city of Chicago in areas that we feel there is the greatest need for them. Or we're going to open up four hotels um, that are going to be for the homeless in Chicago that should be, we should be ashamed of. Give me some concrete actions that are going to be done to deal uh, that we're going to say we're going to we're going to give this amount of a billion dollars to the south of the west sides to develop housing, to develop businesses, to develop um, um, education. Um, give me something concrete. Yeah. I don't want to come anywhere or go anywhere and hear another speech about Dr. King and take some sweet, innocent, young black children to, re to recite his I have a dream speech. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't want to do that anymore. I've, twice in the last year, I walked out of things when that happened because it's a disservice to him. It's a dishonor to him. Um, so let's take concrete action federally, um, uh, statewide, citywide of saying these in honor of Dr. King this year, this is what we're going to do in America, in Chicago. And unless that happens, it's another feel good moment. And like so we've done something yeah. and we haven't. And America, in many ways, you ask about it, are things the same? In many ways, they're worse. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Dr. Cre Dr. King, even with all the conf confrontation against him in that last year after the Vietnam War thing and after his talking about war on poverty, even with that, for people who are progressive and who wanted freedom and justice, black, white, and brown, there was this sense across the country, we're going to still keep fighting. We're going to keep coming after this. We're going to keep fighting for this. We're going to keep demanding this. You don't have that today. You don't have that today. So we've lost that momentum for justice. We've lost that thirst for justice. And in fact, so many people have been so beaten down, Danielle, and you know this, that they feel like we just got to accept this. Yeah. Hell no, we, we're not going to accept this. We refuse to accept this. So let's make Dr. King's day different this year. Will that happen? Not likely. Well, I know you guys will be doing something. You guys always do something very impactful. Can you talk to me about what the St. Sabina community is doing, particularly in Auburn Gresham? to continue Dr. King's legacy and his vision. We are going to be demanding of the city and the state and the country, what are you going to do this Dr. King's day? Or are we just going to once again yawn, have a celebration, sing we shall overcome and go back home? Mm -hmm. What actions is Chicago, Illinois, and America going to take in honor of Dr. King instead of dishonoring him with talk. What is the actions going to take place? Um, and then we are going to, we're demanding of, of the city here and, and, and the police department, 
we want more than talk about what we're going to do in 22 for violence. You know, we've had, I think this is what the, the 10th, we, uh, we have like, I think more than 60 shootings already in, in, in 10 days. My God, why are we not outraged as a city? Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, and even though we're seeing all this, um, now carjackings and smash and grab and all this in downtown the north side mm -hmm. that becomes a major story every time that happens and you know certainly I mean I'm against any of that happened. nobody should be carjacked nobody should be robbed but the reality is you know you hear people all the time in the south side say oh <laughs> welcome to our world yeah. Yeah. this has yeah. been going on without a outrage in the black and the brown community. And now there's a great concern because saying, well, how do we stop it from happening here? No, how do we stop it from happening here. in the city of Chicago? And how do we commit ourselves to saying we are going to be just as committed with talk, with marketing, and with money to deal with violence mm -hmm. as we have been with uh, COVID? You know what? I'm so glad to hear that because, you know, I'm watching, I saw, watched it last week, the Emma Till story, and yeah. we'll be coming on as part two this week. And, and I hope, I was thinking about this and watching this, that we realize the importance of Jet Magazine, the importance of the Defender, the importance yeah. of Black press, yes. um, who made the world know something that they didn't want to know. And it, unless we unless we have that, those community issues, to be re, to reality, mm -hmm. Emmett Till's murder was a community issue. It was. But black press made it a national issue. Yeah. And so I'm so glad to hear that because we do. We, we, we need to have the truth. We do not need to be a, a reflection of the mass media. We need to have a, a, the black viewpoint and the black feelings and the black realities be forced into Please follow the Chicago Defender on all social media platforms and visit our website at www.chicagodefender.com for our week-long special series in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.